My name is Greg Evans. I'm Director of Faith Development and Outreach here at Cornerstone. Welcome. I'm glad you're all here. I had a completely different sermon that I was thinking about teaching this morning. Because of the, the different translations of the Bible, you just saw that uh, message version of that scripture, and I'm going to be referencing that as well as some from the NIV and the NLT during my um, sermon this morning. And what I was almost going to do was I was going to take Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and I was going to read it in the message translation while it was shown on the screen in the NIV or the NLT. And I challenge you to go and check that out at some point. You can go online and you can get the Bible Gateway or one of those apps. Go read what Jesus said in different translations, and it makes a big difference in how you think about um, different scriptures. And so instead of that, though, this morning, I decided I'm going to talk about this kid that's going to come up on the screen here in a minute. Um, you'll, this guy right here, we're going to talk about him for a minute. And as I did this sermon this morning, somebody came to me afterward and a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on the fact that I get so annoyed, and, it, and it's funny because something just happened with the Lord's Prayer, but I get so annoyed with the way I see people responding to each other, especially on social media and different places. And so I'm going to be talking about how we react, how we are judged and how God looks at us as well as how we look at other people. And somebody came to me after the service and said that they saw a sign that said this. How many of y'all have been on Twitter? Raise your hands if you've been on Twitter. And you know, so when you go on Twitter, you put out a post and it's called a tweet. And you make a short little sentence and our president is doing that all the time now. And somebody said that they saw a sign that said, tweet others as you wish to be tweeted. And I thought that was a great way to start this morning. So somebody told me that after first service. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. This guy, there he stood, cake in his hands, a trail of crumbs across the floor, Icing and cake smeared from ear to ear. There was no doubt. There was no blaming someone else. He had been caught in the act. Johnny was old enough to know better. He had been told not to touch the cake because it was for dinner. The next few minutes would stay with Johnny for the rest of his life. What do you think would happen next? Would he be yelled at? Would he be sent to time out? Would he be told to go to bed without supper? Or worse yet, would he have to wait until his father came home? That's what I always was threatened with. For the purpose of the sermon, try to put yourself in Johnny's shoes. Try to be little Johnny. Today we're going to talk a little bit about when someone is caught with cake from ear to ear. Now some of you might prefer foods other than cake when you're thinking about temptations when you're thinking about this sermon, I was originally going to talk about chocolate cake, but I don't really like chocolate cake, and I found out that only 4% of people statistically prefer chocolate cake. I prefer white cake with white icing. Sometimes when something is placed in front of you, whether it's chocolate or white or blue, and you're told not to touch it, whether it's cake or something else in your life, bells start going off, whistles start blowing, lights start flashing, taste buds start salivating, a little demon pops up on one shoulder and an angel pops up on the other one, and you find yourself right in the middle of a battle between good and evil. If you were to go back to Galatians, just a little further back in the, in the Bible, before that scripture that I read, in Galatians 5, 17, it says, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Temptations are not a once in a while thing. We have to deal with them day in and day out. We live in a constant fight 
with opposing natures. The good news is that God can help you resist a temptation. You can learn to recognize people and situations that are more likely to lead you into temptation. I believe that every single person out there, myself, every single one of us, we all know that when that one thing that we're about to do, that not right thing, I think we know, I think we're aware that that thing is not something that we should be doing. My biggest weakness that I'm willing to talk to you about here this morning is flaming hot chips and dip every night since I was a teenager. I would sit in my room and I would watch my 13-inch black and white TV, not much bigger than this sheet of paper that screen was, and I would sit there with my chips and I'd be watching M.A.S.H., or the original Twilight Zone, or Star Trek, the original with Captain Kirk and Spock and Dr. McCoy. He's dead, Jim. And Scotty. Captain, I'm trying everything. We kind of outrun him, and I'm giving her all she's got. Sorry, <laughs> me, me and my chips. I couldn't resist the temptation I still can't. I'm addicted. I told my family just the other night, I said, when I croak, they should sue the Frito-Lay company (laughs) for making addicting products. I don't know if you all remember, but they used to actually advertise. They used to tell us that they were addicting. They used to have a commercial that said, no one can eat just one, right? Now, I can't eat just one bag sometimes. How do we escape when we're tempted? Well, the best way is to run from your temptation. Just turn around. Don't walk into that situation that you know is going to lead you down that road to do something that you're not supposed to do. For me, it's about TV. And I go in there and there's something on and now it's like Deadliest Catch or some other show, I don't, I like those gold miner guys and watching all those crazy people do stuff. And I sit there and there's those chips. Those evil, evil, delicious chips. Instead of doing that, though, I should pray for God's guidance to help with it. And sometimes I do. And I think it works. And you can also seek Christian support and encouragement from Christian friends and people in the church. Maybe not with your chip addiction. There's a lot of other things that you might be wanting to talk about, and maybe you don't want to talk about it. And sometimes that's the deal, is the reality is it's not so easy for us to talk to someone about those things that we struggle with. I wonder how many of us are really comfortable coming clean. Especially in today's society, it's easy to feel judged. It's easy to feel shamed. And unfortunately, That's the way a lot of people see Christians today. They see us as being shaming and as being judgmental. That we see everyone else's problems while we overlook our own, which are obviously, honestly, sometimes they're the same exact problems. And worse, It's now easier than ever and simple to share the knowledge and the judgment that you have with dozens and even thousands of people. So we go back to the cake pick here, and I'd like you to apply that image to your own lives. Maybe it's cake, maybe it's chips, something else. Maybe somebody else has done something. When you have little Johnny standing right in front of you with cake from ear to ear, You have to know as a Christian, according to Scripture, what to do to help restore Johnny gently, to humbly help that person back onto the right path. As Christians, we can learn how to take action, how to react when someone is caught red-handed, how to respond to things in life 
not in anger, but by the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible teach the church to do when someone is caught in a sin? Galatians 6, 1, in a different translation, says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Four ladies of influence in the community met for a friendly lunch. This is a story. During the conversation, one lady said, We need to pour out our hearts. We need to admit certain sins and our needs. Confession is good for the soul. So the first lady confessed that she liked to read racy romance novels. And the second lady confessed that when she balanced the checkbook, she always hid a few dollars and then would tell her husband that she was going to visit her cousin. But instead, she'd sneak off to indulge in a day of frivolous shopping and an extravagant night on the town. The third lady confessed that she had a terrible addiction to gambling. She had recently lost so much money that she had taken a part-time job to pay it back without her husband knowing it. When it came time for the fourth lady, she wouldn't confess. The others pressed her. The others insisted, saying, come on now, we confessed our sin, we admitted our faults, what's yours, what's your secret? Finally, the fourth lady answered, my biggest weakness is gossiping, and I can't wait to get out of here. (laughs) Too many people don't come to church because they feel like they have made mistakes and they know that you know or that you suspect or that you won't accept them or that you'll judge them or that they'll be struck by lightning if they walk into the church. I'm sure some of you have said, I went to school with that person. I used to work with her. She is my cousin once removed. I moved from Las Vegas where you didn't even meet your next door neighbor You would see them go in their garage and come out of their garage, and we all went our separate ways. And then I moved here to Wentzville, and it's like this in a close-knit church in a tight community. You know everything there is to know about one another, and especially in the age of social media. And the temptation that we have a lot of times, our temptation is to make misery out of mistakes. I see it all the time. But God wants to make fruit out of our faults. We should be holding in sacred trust the things that we have heard about one another and what we know about other people. The last thing little Johnny wants to hear when he walks into church on Sunday morning is someone whisper, there's little Johnny. He got caught this week with cake from ear to ear. One of the worst mistakes a Christian can make is to be complacent and self-righteous and start thinking that it's okay to whisper and to judge and to condemn others around you. No Christian should ever think that they themselves are above the temptation of cake or chips or whatever it is that you may be tempted with. We have all made mistakes, but no mistake is too much for the mercy of God. God still has a great plan for your life, but to get your life back, to get your strength back, you have to be forgiven, come clean, be restored, get out of the negative, condemned, hypocritical mindset, self-pity, victim mentality. All that kind of thinking does is keep you from doing the new things that God wants you to do. It's so important to learn to receive God's forgiveness and to learn how to be restored by God's mercy. And then that second verse in Galatians, in the different translation, says this, fulfill the law of Christ, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. 
folks, we have a duty to help each other. You don't bring everyone into one room and then starting, start pointing fingers and condemning somebody in front of the crowd. That's not right. And it dro- destroys the person who is being condemned. The body of Christ, the church, functions best when the members work together. And I have a video here that I'd like you guys to see. I, I'm hoping Mike can get it pulled up and just take a look at this. Okay, kind of explains what so I'm talking about. Harley and Lower are both currently in trouble. Although I believe that only one of them did the dirty little deed. So, Harley and Loa, I need one of you to tell me what the other one did. I need you to rat the other one out. Now, Loa, I know you love your brother, and it would hurt you to turn him in. And Harley, I know you love your sister, and you don't want to get her in trouble. However... Whatever one of you turns the other one in, I will be easy on. If you turn your brother or sister in, you will not be punished, okay? So, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be heartbreaking. I know it's going to be one of the most difficult decisions you've ever made in your life to turn your brother or your sister in. I will give you plenty of time to think about it. I'll ask the question, I'll walk away, I'll give you some time to agonize over it, to search your soul, to figure out what the right answer is going to be within your heart. I will give you the opportunity to do the right thing. I know it's going to take some time, but think about it. Think about doing the right thing, guys. So now I ask you, who took the cookie off the counter? (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's like us. How many times are we putting the paw on somebody else's head? And we may be guilty of the very same thing. What is the law of Christ that I mentioned earlier? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This way you will fulfill the love of Christ. There you stand, little Johnny, cake from ear to ear. What do you need to hear? What do you need to happen next? I'm convinced that the first thing that Jesus would say is, Johnny, I love you, but put the cake down. Jesus would say, Johnny, I don't condemn you, but before we can get you cleaned up, You have to put the cake down. Jesus stands ready to forgive. But forgiveness for any sin begins with confession and repentance. That starts with a change of heart. With God's help, you can accept Christ's forgiveness, but first you have to be willing to stop doing wrong. Then you need to hear someone say, let me help you carry this plate over to the counter and put it down. Johnny needs to know that somebody cares. Johnny needs to hear somebody say, let's talk about it. There comes a time when yelling and time out and sending a kid to bed without supper and wait until your father gets home, comes a time when that doesn't work. All of those actions are punishments. I am thankful that our God is a God of free will and allows us to make choices. Don't get me wrong, Unrepented sin cannot go on unpunished forever without Jesus. But God allows us to make choices. God allows us to make mistakes. But God has also provided the cross. And it's on the cross that Jesus, God's only son, takes our place. He takes the punishment. He takes the sin. So instead of getting the punishment and condemnation we deserve, you and I can have grace and mercy to go free. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. That's from Romans 8.1. 
The phrase caught red-handed literally means guilty of having blood on your hands. Under the cross, we have all been caught red-handed. So many people struggle with the feelings of guilt from condemnation. But just like you learn the feelings of guilt from sin, you can learn the feelings of freedom through forgiveness. Don't just ask for forgiveness. Take it one step further and say, God, I'm asking for your healing. I'm asking for your restoration. What you're saying is, God, I believe that not only have you forgiven me, that you're also restoring me. With confession and repentance and forgiveness, I believe that God begins to restore us everything that the enemy has taken away from us. Zechariah 9.12 says, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. That's what God has promised us when he begins the process to restore us. He doesn't just send us back to our old life. He makes it even better. When God restores us, he makes us stronger, more powerful, more resilient, improved upon our original condition. That's what he does for us. And then when we start to think about others' problems or sins, we should respond the same way. How do we do this? We should test our own actions. If anyone thinks they are something that they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Test yourself when you see somebody else doing something that you don't agree with. Put yourself in that person's shoes. Would you ask for help? Would you be too proud to repent? Would you see your own faults? How many people do you know who believe the lies of the enemy, who go through life with no enthusiasm, no excitement, no hope, broken? God is looking for people who are willing to be restored, who want to be forgiven. Sometimes those old thoughts come up and say you don't deserve forgiveness. You say that's right, but that is what mercy is all about. Don't be so focused on mistakes, yours and other people's, that you can't see the solution right in front of you. People in the Bible were given to us as examples that made mistakes. Moses killed a man. Sarah laughed at God. David had an affair with Bathsheba. Peter denied Christ three times. God never gives up on us. God always gives us another opportunity. Test your own actions. What would you want? How would you want to be treated? Would you give yourself another chance? I blew it. I ruined it. I had my chance and I failed. I had my opportunity and I missed. We have all started things and then not finished what we set out to do. We can't do anything about the past, but we can do something about the present and the future. 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the mistakes you made last week, last month, last year. And Jesus knew that you would see the cake, whatever the cake is for you or the chips. He knew that you would see it. And he knew that you would know that it's wrong and he knew that you would be tempted to eat the cake anyway. As a Christian, as a child of God, when we need help and ask for it, God answers. Hebrews 4.16 says, come boldly to the throne of grace. How many times does God clean up the mess for you? You made a mess, you made a poor choice, but when we ask, God comes along and causes things to work out. We may never know that God worked behind the scenes in our lives to make something work for good. Maybe God caused the right person to come along in our life to offer us a new focus on life and a positive future. Maybe what would have been a bigger mess turned out good 
because of God's mercy. God cleaned, restored, and caused it to work out. How much has God forgiven you of? Who has wronged you that you need to forgive? What does it feel like to be the one who needs to be restored? Today, you can leave here a new person, a clean person, forgiven and restored, changed at the way you look at others because you have changed the way you understand how God looks at you. Today, will you live your life by the Holy Spirit so that you can help to restore people like Johnny who are covered in cake from ear to ear? Will you help to restore people and forgive them gently without judging? Putting yourself in their situation, walking a mile in their shoes, not condemning, but sharing and carrying the burdens of one another in a Christ-like way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us can stop feeling like we have to be the ones that are making the judgment, that we are the ones that are gonna point out other people's faults, that are gonna point out other people's mistakes, I pray, God, that we will be the ones who will go out from this place and we will look at people through their eyes and realize that people are not attempting to fail. People are not trying to fail. People are doing the best that they can do. And that when we see them falling, that we see them failing, we see them doing things that we don't agree with, that we will not point fingers, put our paws on their head, judge them, and walk away, but that we will be gentle and we will help them come to you to resolve those problems. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.